The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 16. This is a mishtam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. All right, we've got Leviticus 24, verses 1 through 9 is our sermon today. It's entitled, The Holy Oil and the Holy Bread. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. One thing you can say about the Bible is that it is always consistent. It uses things from nature consistently. It uses numbers consistently. It uses moral issues consistently. You can, for example, do a study on trees in the Bible, and you will find consistent patterns in the use of trees. Or you can pick certain trees and find consistent pattern in the use of those trees. What about the number five? If you go through the Bible, a theme will develop based on the number five that is simply remarkable. It is the number of grace. Now, if I didn't tell you that, and if you just did your own thorough study, you would figure it out all by yourself. What is more than amazing is that these themes weren't all decided upon, written down, and then built upon one person upon another. Rather, unless you knew that God was directing these things, you would assume exactly the opposite was true. You would say these books were written eons apart. They were written in different countries by various people, and yet coincidentally, the patterns match. How can that be? This can't be coincidence at all. You would have to come to this conclusion because for the most part, the patterns weren't discovered until long after they were written down. In fact, many of the patterns have only been discovered in recent years. It's a marvel and it is amazing. But it is one of those remarkable proofs that the Bible is what it claims to be, the Word of God. No random chance could have come up with these patterns time and time and time again. Our text verse comes from Psalm 132. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. 
There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed one. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. Today, we're going to look at several things which form patterns in Scripture that are seen right in these six verses from that psalm. We will look at the dwelling place, we'll look at rest, we'll look at bread, we'll look at the lamp, and quite a few other things that are not in this psalm. All of them are found in just nine verses, and yet, if you were to do a study on any single one of them, you would find the same consistency running throughout Scripture. Once something is introduced, it generally remains tied into the same concept all the way through until the very end of the Bible. I'm sure I'm like any one of you. At times, I have doubts about things. Can it all be true? Can the Bible be relied upon? Am I sure about what I've read and what it means to my eternal future? When I have doubts flicker in my mind like this, all I need to do is think about what I've already learned. The marvel of this book is that once you've really looked into it, and once you've really thought about all that it teaches, all that it reveals, and all that it details, you can once again feel confident that the doubts were all for naught. The Lord is a safe place because his word says he is. As the psalmist said, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. The word reveals, and that is all I need. Thank God for this marvelous treasure. Great things are to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have just two thoughts for you today. The first is care of the menorah. It's verses one through four. Verse one, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, words of law and words of instruction lie ahead. Therefore, the Lord speaks only to Moses. From there, Moses will relay the commands he receives to the people. The Lord had just given the instructions for the weekly Sabbath feast of the Lord and the seven annual feasts of the Lord. And with that accomplished, he will now give instructions for the daily and weekly services required for the menorah and the table of showbread. The importance of this placement cannot be understated because the Lord had just said in verse 23:3 that the Sabbath day is a Sabbath of solemn rest and it is a holy convocation. Because of this, the Lord directed explicitly to the people, you shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And yet, in the next three verses, no exemption is given for performing the daily rituals on the Sabbath. And in verse 8, Aaron and his sons, meaning the priests, are explicitly told to violate the Sabbath in order to honor the Lord. In other words, in the temple, there is, in essence, no earthly Sabbath, but there is rest. There is work done, but it is work which is in the presence of the Lord who is at his place of rest. God rested on the seventh day, a day on which the Genesis account recorded no evening or morning. It is an eternal day. The priests in type enter that place of rest. And so whatever they do, it may violate or profane the Sabbath, but it does not profane God's rest, which the Sabbath only anticipates. At the temple, the priests worshiped and served the Creator in a place of rest, which is exactly what man was originally created to do, and which is exactly what the final pages of Scripture say that man will do in heaven. In this, we can now see that the words of Jesus in Matthew 12 are referring directly to what is stated in Leviticus. There we read this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath." What Jesus was saying with the words, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, is that he is the anticipated Messiah. 
And because of this, his authority as the Messiah is superior to the law of the Sabbath. And so no guilt can be imputed either to him or to his disciples who have acted under his authority, just as the priests here in Leviticus are going to be directed to profane the Sabbath under the authority of the Lord. The adjective used in the words, one greater than the temple, is neuter. The neuter is used to give a solemn, impressive sense of what he is referring to, which is himself, his body. It is the temple which is greater than the temple in Jerusalem. If Jehovah of the temple directed the priests to profane the Sabbath in order to conduct their duties, then such was allowed for one greater than the temple. The temple is the sanctuary where Jehovah dwelt. In saying that he is greater than the temple, he is making an absolute claim to deity. If the temple is God's dwelling place and profanation of the Sabbath is conducted there to honor the Lord, it is because the Lord, meaning Jehovah, is greater than the temple. In his claim is an implicit but absolute claim to being Jehovah incarnate. The corresponding account in Mark adds in the words, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Man was created first and only then was he given rest. The rest was intended for man's good and for his happiness. The laws of the Sabbath were intended to promote that state in man, not feelings of misery or unhappiness. But more, the Sabbath was intended to honor the Lord while in that happy state. As the Lord was among them, and he was pleased with their happiness at being filled, then no wrong could be imputed. The disciples were hungry, and so out of necessity, in order to meet the intent of the Sabbath, they plucked the grain and they ate. As they were with Jesus, who is one who is greater than the temple, they were fulfilling his will in the process. The one who gave the Sabbath laws could dispense with those laws because he is the place of rest which the law pointed to. There is nothing arbitrary in Jesus' words or actions. Rather, he is making a theological point concerning himself, his nature, his being, and his disciples' relationship to him. As the priests of Leviticus could profane the Sabbath before the Lord and yet be blameless, so could his disciples likewise be blameless in his presence when doing the same. With this understanding, we can see why the Lord placed these verses here in Leviticus. Serving the Lord in his place of rest is more important than the Sabbath laws which he had just given to Israel back in the previous chapter. This would be true even on the Day of Atonement, the most holy day of the annual calendar, and a Sabbath day all its own, as is seen in the next verse. Verse 2, command the children of Israel. These words go back to Exodus 27, verse 20 and 21. Moses is instructed to command the children of Israel. This is one of only two times in Leviticus that the Lord tells Moses to command in this way. It is more direct and forceful than the normal words which say, speak to the children of Israel. The change is certainly given because of the obvious conflict with the Sabbath laws which were just presented in the feasts of the Lord. If the Lord gave those directives and now he gives these commands, then there can be no contradiction between the two. His Sabbath laws are to be dispensed with according to his directives, just as any laws can be dispensed with when given by the proper authority. The U.S. Constitution may be amended according to the authority of the U.S. Constitution. Each initiator may amend or dispense with the laws which he has set forth. Verse 2 continues, that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light. The words which have been given as a command to the people are that they are expected to bring shemen zayit zak kalit lama or, or pure oil of pressed olives for the light. Everything about this anticipates Christ. First is the shemen or oil. That comes from shamen. It's a verb meaning to grow fat. That in turn comes from a root meaning to shine. The oil of the zayit or olive is designated. Oil can be derived from a multitude of sources, but in order to picture Christ, the olive is named. The olive is a symbol of religious privilege. It is the spirit working through those who are included in this privilege. The olives receive their fatness from the roots. Those branches which are a part of the tree receive this fatness and produce olives, which are then used to put forth light before the Lord. The word pure is the adjective zak, 
This indicates clean, clear, or pure. It has only been seen twice so far in Exodus to describe this exact same oil and also the frankincense which is used in the incense to be burned on the altar of incense. This would be the finest oil possible. The word pressed here is not a good translation. Rather, it should say beaten. It is the adjective katit. That comes from a root meaning to be crushed by beating. Rather than being pressed under heavy stones, it would probably be gently beaten in a pounding mortar, just enough to break the skin. The oil would usually come from unripe fruit. It would come out clear and without color, and it would give a pure, bright light, and it would have very little smoke. After the gentle beating to break the skin, the full olives would be placed in a strainer of some sort, like a wicker basket, in order to allow their juice to simply drip through by gravity alone. The liquid would simply run through that and into the bowl. From there, the purest oil would float to the top and be skimmed off. Out of this, the anticipated result would be oil with no impurities at all, and thus the very finest possible. As I said, everything about this looks forward to Christ. First, he is the source of the shemen, or oil, and he is the one who makes the tree flourish in its increasing fatness. Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 11, using the olive tree as a metaphor for God's religious privileges being bestowed first upon the Jews of Israel, then upon the Gentiles, and which will again return to the Jews. The Lord promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that from them would spring the messianic promises. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 11, verses 16 through 18. There he says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches, meaning the Jews, were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree... Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. The religious privilege which comes from the roots went from Jew to Gentile, but it is Christ from whom the promises spring and to whom they belong. His body is the tree and his life is the fatness. That is why the word zak or pure is used. Christ's purity is revealed in the olives which grow from the branches. Whether Jew or Gentile, the pure produce of the olives is what is used to cause the light to shine. For Jew, Jesus told them to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew chapter 5. For Gentile, Paul writes saying that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, Philippians chapter 2. The beating of the olives is reflective of the treatment of first Christ and then those who are in Christ. Peter explains this. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered, think of the olives being beaten, Christ, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. This pure oil from the fatness of the olive, all pointing to Christ and those who are in Christ who bring forth their offering, was to be used, verse 2 continues, to make the lamps burn continually, to cause to ascend the lamp perpetually. In other words, to have the light of the lamp to rise continually. It doesn't mean to burn as if to consume. Instead, it is a word which normally is used to express an action such as the burning of a sacrifice which is offered to the Lord. There it ascends to the Lord. It could thus be paraphrased to say, to cause the lamp to ascend to the Lord continually. There is a debate as to whether the lamp was to burn continually day and night or if it was to burn every night continually. It appears from Exodus 27, verse 21, Exodus 30, verse 8, and from the next verse that the lamp, meaning the menorah, only burnt throughout the night. The idea of a light is to illuminate, and that's only needed where there is darkness. 
Ultimately, then, the light is reflective of the eternal nature of Christ, which shines and dispels all darkness for all eternity. That is seen in Revelation chapter 22, from the last page of the Bible. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. This light was to shine and never go out. It is the eternal light of Christ, which always shines before the Lord. But as we have seen, the olives are reflective of the produce of the people. Thus, we see the result of Christ in one's life. In Daniel chapter 12, for example, it says this of the faithful Jews. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Paul uses a similar theme when speaking to the Gentiles in Ephesus. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret." But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. It is Christ who is the light and which he imparts to and through his people. It is the same idea as the incense reflecting Christ in every single detail. And yet, the burning of the incense is the prayers of the people, sanctified to God by Christ. Verse 3, outside the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting. These words are given after mentioning the bringing of oil. It is for the lamp which is in the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, the Lord is specifying the particular lamp. Because of the abrupt change in the subject from the feasts of the Lord to the bringing in of oil, this is being made clear to Moses. It is the lamp which is previously described and which is in the tabernacle outside the veil and before the testimony. In the use of the words outside the veil of the testimony, we can see a truth which should not be missed. The Lord could have simply said in the tent of meeting or in the holy place but he specifically mentions the veil of the testimony. The veil, or paroket, signifies a fracture exists in which on one side there is rest and on the other side there is labor and rigor. If you remember the symbolism of the veil, it is the body of Christ. It was torn when he died, his body was torn. It is explicitly said that in the book of Hebrews. The testimony, meaning the law, contained in the ark is where rest is found. However, man has fallen and is kept apart from God because of violations of the law. However, Christ is the fulfillment of the law, and in him is rest. The deeds of the people and their light which shines is only acceptable because of Christ. Again, we must think of the symbolism of the olive tree, the branches and the fruit which the branches bear. Our deeds are only acceptable because of being in Christ our prayers, symbolized by the incense which burns in this same room, are only acceptable because of him. In the end, only because of Christ is there anything which is found acceptable in us. Does everybody understand that? It is absolutely important for us to understand that when he says the veil, he's asking us to think, why did he say the veil? Is because Christ is the division between God and fallen us. He is the mediator. He is the one that allows the prayers to go through him, symbolized by the smell of the incense going into the holy place. Everything about this is picturing Jesus Christ. Everything. Verse 3 continues, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning. Aaron here means Aaron and his sons, as was explicitly stated in Exodus 27. The lamp was to be tended to throughout the night. This suggests that it was not left burning during the day, but some commentaries disagree. No matter what, the symbolism of perpetual light is not diminished by having natural sunlight because Christ is called the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness in Malachi 4, verse 2. Verse 3 continues, before the Lord continually. The burning of the lamp is of particular interest to the Lord. The first thing that must be brought into a house for its inhabitants to function properly is light. And for light to shine, there must be something to produce that light. 
In this case, it is the oil, signifying the spirit in action, and thus life itself. It is reflective of the first command given after the creation of the universe. Then God said, let there be light. Thank you. And there was light. Here, after the calendar-driven feasts of the Lord, and then more calendar-driven instructions to come in the next chapter, we have this chapter, which commences with the care of the lamps and the table of showbread. In this, we can see that the light here is that which burns throughout the duration of the entire calendar. It is a reflection of the work of Christ from beginning to end and throughout all of the ages. About 1,500 years after this, we will see what this light pictures as it flows from John's pen concerning Jesus. Here in John chapter 1, we read, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And he is that same light which we are seeing shining on the last page of the Bible. It is Christ now, at all times, and throughout all ages. There is design, there is intent, and there is wisdom seen in this seemingly misplaced passage of Scripture. Verse 3 continues, It shall be a statute forever in your generations. As always, these words must be taken in their proper context. As these things only picture Christ in His work, the statute forever means until the time when they are revealed and fulfilled in Christ. Now, that which was once physically given is spiritually realized in Him and in His people. Verse 4, He shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. The verse is literally translated as, Upon the menorah, the pure, He shall array the lamps before the Lord continually. The reason for using the definite article before pure is that it was made of pure gold. Thus, it symbolizes Christ in His divine nature. What may also be inferred from this definite article is that the menorah was kept pure by keeping it clean of any ashes which might have fallen on it. It was always pure internally and externally. Thus, it is reflective of Christ's perfect purity in all ways, physical, moral, etc. The use of the word arak or array is to signify that the lamps were always to be arranged as the Lord previously described in Exodus. To understand all of the symbolism of this most important article, you should go back and watch the sermon from Exodus 25. It is an astonishing lesson. As far as the arraying of the seven lamps on it, it is reflective of the letters of the seven churches in Revelation, called the seven lampstands. The arranging of the lamps here is reflective of Christ's arranging of the lampstands of the church. The purest of gold fit for a king was used to make a seven-branched lampstand. Seeing its beauty makes my heart sing, the workmanship marvelous, stunning, and grand. Every detail is so beautiful, each knob and flower, the glistening of the branches as they catch the light. It shines in the dark for hour after hour, illuminating the holy place throughout the night. The glory of God is seen in each detail. Every branch speaks out a marvelous story, and in what it pictures, nothing will fail as the Lord reveals to us His unending glory. Our second thought today is the holy bread, verses 5 through 9. Verse 5, and you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Now in Leviticus is introduced the actual bread of the presence for the table of showbread, which was first described in Exodus 25. It never mentioned the making of bread until now. The preparation for the bread was done by the priests, as we find recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, where it says, And some of their brethren, the sons of the Kohathites, were in charge of preparing the showbread for every Sabbath. For the bread, solet, or fine flour, was to be used. This comes from an unused root, meaning to strip. Thus, it is fine flour indicating purity. It is reflective of the purity of Christ. The word for cake is halal. It comes from the word halal, or to pierce. That is the word used to describe what happened to Christ when he was pierced for our transgressions. From this, 12 cakes were to be made. The number 12 in Scripture denotes, Doctor, do you know what it denotes? Not yet. I gave him the book, uh, Number in Scripture, by E.W. Bullinger, and I wondered if he had read it yet and made his notes. It denotes perfection of government or governmental perfection. 
Christ is the bread of life, but he has revealed himself through his established government. First, that of the 12 tribes of Israel who proclaimed his coming, and then through the 12 apostles who proclaimed his having come. Verse 5 continues, two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. The two tenths of each cake reveals him as well. The amount for each equals two omers, the amount that two men could eat in one day. But instead of saying that, it says two tenths. Thus there are 24 tenths total in the bread. Two is an indication of difference in the Bible, that there is another. Ten is the perfection of divine order. Thus we have a division of the divine order reflected in the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. God's divine order in Christ is worked out through these divisions and it is seen in this bread. Verse six, you shall set them in two rows, six in a row. All of a sudden we have another number added into the Bible. The translation here though is not correct. They were arranged in two piles. The table is not big enough to place them in two rows. If your Bible says, Rose, it's incorrect, make a note, okay? The word used is a new one in scripture which will be seen just nine times, always in connection to the bread. It signifies an arrangement, whatever that arrangement may be. Each pile is of six loaves. Does anybody here know what the number six signifies in the Bible? It is the number of man, always in the Bible, especially fallen man, but it is the number of man. Six is that number. We are seeing a picture develop of men, representing all men before the Lord, because here are the uh, loaves, right? And they're there before the Lord. So these are men that represent all men before the Lord. In each pile, there are 12 tenths. In other words, one pile signifies the 12 tribes of Israel. The other signifies the 12 apostles. Together, they form the perfection of divine order, the number 10, in God's perfection of government, the number 12. It is this which led to and which is then revealed in Christ, the bread of life. It is a picture of what is seen in Revelation 4, verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. You see what's being pictured there? The bread represents the 24 elders, the tribes of Israel, and the apostles, all represented in what we're seeing right here. Nothing is said about whether the bread contained yeast or not, though. It could go either way as far as what it actually pictured. The Pentecost loaves had yeast because they reflected Jew and Gentile being acceptable to God despite their sin because of Christ's covering. Such could be the case here. Or it could be that they were unleavened and thus reflect only Christ's purity. Jewish writers such as Flavius Josephus state that they were unleavened. What matters is that it doesn't matter. The Bible is silent on the matter. Verse 6 continues, On the pure gold table before the Lord, the shulchan, or table, is a word that indicates to stretch out or to spread out. It is a place of expanse. Again, the wording is precise in the Hebrew. On the table, the pure before the Lord. The table was overlaid with pure gold, and it was certainly kept pure through constant maintenance. And again, it would be reflective of Christ, pure and undefiled internally and externally. The details for this table are recorded in Exodus 25. If you didn't hear that sermon on its makeup, you missed a great deal. You have your instructions for this afternoon. This table, like the menorah, is said to be before the Lord. Because of its location, it is elsewhere called Lechem Ha Panim, or literally, bread of the faces. Translations will then call them the bread of the presence. What we have is the idea of the Lord's eyes always being on those who are in Christ. He is the bread. His people are of the same lump. As Paul says in Romans chapter 11, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. Verse 7, and you shall put pure frankincense on each row. Levona zakha, or frankincense pure, was to be placed either on or by each pile. The word can indicate either. As there would have been room for the incense on the table, it was probably alongside of the bread. This levona, or frankincense, comes from the word lavan, meaning brick. The concept of a brick in the Bible is one of human work. At the Tower of Babel, the people made bricks in order to work their way to heaven. 
In Egypt, the people were forced to make brick without straw and were unable to perform their duties. In both instances, pictures were being made of man's futile attempt at pleasing God through works. Their brick making was tainted and it was unacceptable. This incense, however, is zakah, or pure. It is reflective of the pure works of Christ or of those who are in Christ, which are deemed acceptable to God because of Christ. This is then more fully explained with the words, verse 7 continues, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. As it is for the bread as a memorial, it is specifically speaking of the acceptable works of Christ. The bread is a bloodless offering from the children of Israel, representative of the people of God, who are diligent in sanctifying themselves to perform good works. It is the works of Christ, however, which makes them acceptable. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. As can be seen, the Gentiles, like Israel, have also become an offering to God because of the work of Christ, sanctified through what he has accomplished. It is through this great work that the Holy Spirit is available to do exactly that, the process of sanctification. This is the very heart of the work of Christ, that together Jew and Gentile are found acceptable through him. It is therefore his work which is offered up to God as an offering made by fire to the Lord, pictured by this pure frankincense. Verse 8, every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. What day of the week are they to do this? The Sabbath. That's right. It's a Saturday. They are ordered. They are instructed to violate the Sabbath. Is everybody seeing this? They are picturing those who are ministering before the Lord. We are in Christ. What does that tell you about having a Sabbath day? It's done. It's over. We are not required to have a Sabbath day. It's as clear and as obvious as it could be in the pages of Scripture. If you are willing to take the Bible in the proper context. They are there in the temple. We are in Christ. He is the temple. They violate the Sabbath, but they do not profane God's rest. We are in Christ. We are not profaning God's rest. We are living God's rest. I hope everybody remembers that lesson. Lest you go to a church someday and the pastor says you have to have a Sabbath day off. Spend all day in church and listen to my boring sermon. Okay? That's not true. We are in Christ. We are in our rest. The bread was changed out every Sabbath, as prescribed here. Because of the words, before the Lord continually, tradition says that the Jews made this an exceptionally solemn service. As the old bread was being removed, the new bread was being put in its place at exactly the same moment. One priest's hands removing the old, while the other priest's hands inserted the new. That's just a tradition, but that's what they did. For us, the symbolism here in Leviticus is pretty remarkable. The new bread was rested on the day of rest, in the Lord's presence, at his place of rest, on this table. It must be at least partially what David was thinking of when he wrote the 23rd Psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The people of God may be hemmed in by enemies, but they are in the middle of it, right in the house of the Lord. We are in Christ. A table is set where the people of God can stretch out in ease and rest. It is the promise of a return to Eden and the presence of the Lord, all because of the work of Jesus Christ, which makes us acceptable to God once again. Verse 8 continues, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. God required it of them, and they had agreed to the covenant. Therefore, whether in substance or in money to purchase the substance, the items for the menorah and the table of showbread were provided from the children of Israel. In other words, these things are reflective of the people, and it is Christ who establishes his people. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are reflected in the very things that we are looking at today, the oil and the bread. It is you 
that is being pictured here. Verse 9, And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. The bread of this passage is one of only a very limited number of things which were required to be eaten in a holy place by the priests. Despite this being for the priests, this is the same bread which was given to David when he was escaping from Saul and which I cited by Jesus' mouth in the book of Matthew earlier. That is found in 1 Samuel chapter 21, and I'm going to read you the whole thing. So David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king has ordered me on some business and said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread on hand. But there is holy bread, if the young men have kept themselves from women. Then David answered the priest and said to him, Truly, women have been kept from us about three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread, which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. Only by a stretch of the law here in Leviticus could this have come about. It says that the bread was only to be eaten by the priests and only in a holy place. But the bread was given to David and he took it with him. And yet Jesus cited this exact account in Matthew 12, indicating that the request of David and the decision of the priests was not unacceptable. The need of the man outweighed the precept of the law. Verse 9 finishes with, For it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. The bread offering was considered most holy, and therefore it was only to be eaten by males and only in the sanctuary. Anything deemed most holy is, in itself, a picture of Christ. The bread reflects those in Christ, and thus those considered holy to the Lord. Therefore, it was restricted to the priests alone for consumption. The words, offerings of the Lord made by fire, is speaking of the incense, not the bread. The incense being connected to the Lord was burnt on the altar while the bread was eaten by the priests. The symbolism is that of Christ being offered up to God and the people being acceptable to God because of Christ's mediation. Each thing is logically presented to show us both the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the acceptability of those in Christ to God. What is implied here and what is stated explicitly elsewhere is that only those who are in Christ are acceptable to God. Even the Jews, the people of God's choosing, who do not receive Jesus are as branches broken off. And those Gentiles who are not of the nation of Israel are grafted into the people of God because of faith in Christ. In the end, all that matters between God and the people of the world comes down to one issue alone. Do you have faith in Christ Jesus or do you not? The difference is eternal in scope. If you have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, who has done all of the work necessary, pictured in the frankincense which is offered to God, all that's necessary to restore us to a right relationship with God, today would be a very good day for you to do so. We talked in the Prophecy Update about children dying of the flu and expected 56,000 people punching their final ticket because of the flu. Any one of us could get that. Anybody listening right now could get that, and they could die this week. We have no idea what's coming. We could walk outside, get in our car, and get side whacked by somebody on the road. We have no idea what's coming. I left church last week, and I was going uh, right up to the uh, light here, and there was this lady that went across on a bike to the middle lane, and the guy was way behind her, and so I went to go around him, and without even looking, if I was there, he pulled right in front of me. I just about killed that guy. I just about ran him over, and that would have been the end of him. All he was concerned about was, I'm on a bike, and everybody's going to look out for me. Yeah. And I, I, that was almost the end of him. We don't know our final day. And if you are not right with God when you die, you will be separated from God forever and ever and ever. And the way you get reconciled to God. It's so simple. I'm just going to take you there. I'm going to read it right out of the Word. I say it week after week, but sometimes I just want to read it right from the Bible so that it'll hopefully pierce your heart a little bit more. Romans chapter 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, Jehovah, He is God incarnate. He is the Lord. If you confess your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, 
If you believe that, if you simply say, I accept that Christ died for my sins and God raised him from the dead for my justification, you will be saved. And then he explains it. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. He asks us to believe, and then he asks us to confess it. And one of the ways that you can confess that you have received the Lord Jesus is to go out and to be baptized. If you've never been baptized by full immersion, the Lord would ask you to do that. I don't care if you were baptized when you were a little kid or not. It makes no difference, right? If you were sprinkled as a baby, I was sprinkled over at that apostate church on Siesta Key when I was a kid. It means nothing. But the picture of baptism is saying, I want to follow Christ in death and in his resurrection. I'm buried with Christ. I'm raised to newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what happened to him. And he asked us to follow him in, in that picture. It's a public proclamation of what Christ has done for you. So first, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and then get out there and get baptized. And if you want me to do it, just remind me to bring you up, okay? And we'll be fine. <laughs> All right? I've got a closing verse for you today from Psalm 52. It's verses 8 and 9. Now, didn't we go through a ton of yes. symbolism in this sermon? I mean, you've got the bread. You've got the oil. You've got the olive. You've got the, uh, the, the fatness in the tree. You've got the tree itself. You've got the numbers. You've got 15 different numbers. You've got rest. You, the number of pictures in these nine verses, which will follow all the way through the rest of the Bible, everything that you saw a symbolism for today will follow suit. And that takes us right back to the beginning of the sermon where I said that it's always consistent and it is something that you can say when you're having your doubts, because I get them. Oh God, how can you love me after what I've done today? When you have those kind of doubts, you simply go to the word and you say, you know what? It's too perfect to be by chance. It is not possible that this could have been by chance because it was written in up in Babylon. It was written in Persia. It was written outside of, you know, Israel, down in the Sinai Peninsula. It was written in Israel. It was written around the Roman Empire as Paul wrote these things. And it is always consistent. Forty different people wrote it over 1,500 years. And it is all, 1,600 years. And it is always consistent. It's written in Aramaic. It's written in Hebrew. It's written in Greek. And it is always consistent. When you have doubts, just think it through. God went to all of this effort to give us this marvelous word so that we would be reassured when the troubled times do come, okay? Closing verse. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. Wonderful stuff. Next week, we have Leviticus 24, 10 through 23. What will you pay with? Dollars and cents? It's entitled Recompense for an Offense. That'll be our 44th Leviticus sermon. And as I remind you each week, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. We talked about that in the Thursday night Bible study, didn't we? I had some people actually email me and thank, they said, oh, it was perfect timing on that. We are right where we are supposed to be. Every pain and every trial that we are facing is not unknown to God, and he gave it to us for a reason. Every single one of them. We think, oh, it's out of control. And he says, no, it's not. You're going to see the glory of the Lord worked through this. Anyway, he's got a good plan and a purpose for you. Even if you have a lifetime of sin heaped up behind you, and he can even use that for his glory. People with that lifetime of sin become the most wonderful Christians. We do mission work with a guy that had more failings than probably any person on this planet, didn't he? He was in prison three times, should be there for the rest of his life, three-time felon, in jail many, many times, an alcoholic, a drug addict, a brawler, and he is the most humble, gentle soul that I know on this planet now. Absolutely the most. Absolutely a wonderful human being. It's an honor to know him and to share in life with him. He can wash all that sin away, and he can purify you completely and wholly just as he did with all of us so follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you okay here's our poem and we're done oil and bread <laughs> then the lord spoke to moses saying these are the words he was then relaying command the children of israel that they bring to you pure oil so shall it be of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it, this endeavor, from evening until morning before the Lord continually. 
and shall be a statute in your generations forever. He shall be in charge of the lamps, so shall it be on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. And you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake, so you shall do, so to you I do submit. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord is where they shall go. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial on the bread. An offering made by fire to the Lord, it shall be accomplished, as I have said. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order continually before the Lord, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant according to my word. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual statute. Such shall be the case. Wonderful pictures of Christ and his work for us are revealed in the holy oil and the holy bread of Israel. Every word shows us more hints of Jesus and of his marvelous works each does tell. Thank you, O oh God, for such a wonderful word. Thank you for the mysteries which are hidden there. Each that we pull out speaks of Jesus, our Lord. Thank you that in his goodness we too can share. For all eternity we shall sing to you our praise. Yes, from this time forth and even for eternal days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this lesson today, which was just so needed at least in my life. I don't know about anybody else, but I sure need to remind myself of these things. And the lessons that we find in verses like this really help me to have my faith solidified and to remember that you're in control and that everything is well with my soul. And I hope that that is the case with each person who has heard these words today and that they can reflect on it and contemplate what you have done in your word and how it is revealed in us. Actually sitting in this church right now is something that was pictured thousands of years ago out in the Sinai desert from the hand of Moses. How incredible is that? But this is what it says and this is what we by faith believe. And so we offer to you our souls, our lives, the produce of our lives, the light that shines from the olives that come from us. And for the oil that is in us, help our lights to shine in a way that is radiant for the world to see and people to want to have a hunger for this word and for who you are and to pursue you all the days of our lives and their lives. And we thank you for the chance to do these things. You've given us this walk in life to use properly. Help us to do so. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, you get these people that don't believe that the... Uh, the uh, story of the Bible is true, and they say, oh, we're setting aside our intelligence. There's nothing set aside intelligence. <laughs> if nothing else, if nothing else, we get to hear the Word of God. And if, let me tell you something, if this isn't true, and we're all just bugs, and we're going to be extinguished in a couple of years, at least we got to hear something productive in the process, not something negative by these evolutionists and, and uh, you know, atheists. We use our minds and we think things through and we're willing to take the chance and to have a true and grounded hope in the creator of the universe. I've got no problem with that. I've got zero problem spending my life doing this. Zero. It's wonderful. Okay, here we go. Let me get this baby on and we'll uh, get the instructions for the Lord's Supper right out of the Bible. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul leads us to. And he says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And he would have given thanks over this bread. He would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Somebody called me from uh, up north, I think he's Minnesota, I, I, yesterday, and we talked for a few minutes, and he says he's right here with us, taking the uh, Lord's Supper every week, and then uh, we have we know that Sergio and Rhoda are there because they were watching, yeah. right? They're, and they're with their parents today, so they're all sitting around, and uh, we've got people that are scattered around that are sharing this with us, and so that's why every week I raise this to them first, and I say the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they're here with us in, in fellowship. Isn't that wonderful? Mm, yes. Come on forward. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are ready. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glad you're feeling better. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What'd you do here? It was an ugly stick. Oh, no. It's a facial oh. dermatologist. Thing. Oh, okay. A photo. But you're okay. Skin. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, thank you again for the fellowship that we have in this church and with those who are here with us. And uh, I would pray that if uh, they could find a good church to attend, that one would open in their town and that they could have personal fellowship, that would be great. And if not, then we would hope that uh, we could treat them as brothers and sisters that are literally right here with us, sharing in the, the word with you, sharing in a walk with you, able to talk to one another about our trials and our troubles and to have one another carry our burdens. Help us to be that way and help us to uh, just acknowledge your goodness in all things that we do in this life. You are so good to us. We love you. We appreciate every good blessing. 
And when bad times come, just give us enough strength to praise you. And with that, we should be satisfied. We love you and we do praise you. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.